Hello. Hello, Richard. Are you Hello, wearing a scarf calling? as well? Who, who's there? It's you know who it is. <laughs> what, what did you say? Are you wearing a scarf as well? Oh, are you wearing a scarf? Yeah, we're both wearing scarves. Well, you see, I don't know about you, but my missus hates putting the heating on. <laughs> That's the trouble. She keeps saying it's not December yet. Oh, is that how it works? It's yeah. by the month. Mm. Yeah, December to March, we're allowed to put the heating on. Right. No, I've just terrible? I've just extended the heating timing a bit, but uh, <laughs> cool. It's uh, well. It's this chilly. is a fascinating podcast already, isn't it? I know. What should we just call it a day there? <laughs> Best ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That'll do. Can't wait to see the reviews for this one. <laughs> Fascinating contemporary bants about uh, the weather and heating in the UK. Uh, anyway, shall we get on with um, Pod 24, Richard? Pod 24. Come on, then, let's do it. Here we go. This is Shane Rummer, and you are listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> now, Richard, before we start... Yeah. I have received a couple of complaints. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> this is about the podcast, not anything in oh, my Oh, I see. Oh, that's all right. Then. No, no. Uh, so I've yeah. been told um, that my incessant coughing ah. is becoming annoying. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you can't <laughs> help it, can you? I think that's rather harsh. No, I can't help it. I, I, mean, would, th- I, I would think they'd be more likely to be annoyed by your incessant talking, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are a rotter, aren't you? <laughs> uh, no, so... Right. I apologise. Who, who complained about that? Well, when I say I've had complaints, yes. I mean Nick Briggs, last week's <laughs> interviewee, complained about my coughing, not only on last week's podcast, but also I was recently a guest on his. Yes. And he said, your, your incessant coughing's ruined my well, podcast. Well, well. So... Tune in to the Benji and Nick show for incessant coughing from me. Excellent. Uh, now, I'm nearly over the annoying cough. It's taken a while, is not it? It has taken too long. Mm. Um, so, uh, but uh, the problem is... Yes. As we'll hear shortly, the, this week's interview segment uh-huh. was recorded in July 2017 yeah. when I also was at the tail end of a terrible oh, cough. Honestly, you're so a I'm sickly do- child, aren't I, you? I'm you not always normally. It just happens that... Anyway, so... <laughs> I'm going to do my best not to cough during our talky bits, but okay. the the bit in the the interview bit is unavoidable. Anyway, okay. yes. who but on said, earth you are you? Complaints. You said we've had some complaints. <laughs> have there been others? No, no. I mean, there are two complaints from Nick Briggs. I yeah. see. <laughs> but I'm sure others have found it annoying. I find it annoying. <laughs> anyway, Richard, this is enough. Who 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 are we? To oh, talk yes. about this coughing stuff. Yeah. Who are you? Who on earth are we? Uh, well, I'm I'm Richard James, um, actor, father, husband, uh, uncle, great uncle. Uh, friend, enemy, uh, and um, uh, was once in uh, Jerry Anderson's Space Precinct. I think that covers all bases, doesn't it? Brilliant. But Brilliant. who are you? Uh, I'm Jamie Anderson, uh, human, scarf wearer, mm. incessant coffer, uh, <laughs> owner of a rubbish res- respiratory tract and yeah. immune system. Obviously. Uh, godfather. Yeah. Uh, dog owner, oh yeah, almost zoo owner, yes. and son of the late great Jerry Anderson. Fantastic! I think that just about sums it all up, doesn't it? I think those are the best intros we've ever, ever done yeah. for this podcast. That's brilliant, and we are of course here because uh, you're listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast. This is Pod Twenty Four, uh, so we have a different uh, edition every week, obviously, uh, and this will be the twenty fourth. That's amazing! <laughs> I can't believe it. Twenty four. Can you how, believe we've how, kept it up? I know. How long are we going to keep going with this, Jamie? Until people tell us to stop. <clears throat> 
Yeah, probably. Well, which, if I keep coughing, will be yes. pod 25. Yes, exactly. And so coming up this week, we've got all the usual. We've got news from Jerry Anderson Universe, of course. We've got some listeners' emails that you've been sending in to podcast.jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, we've also got Chris Dale and his amazing randomizer, which we know is... Uh, uh, very popular because you tweet us about it so a little later on I'll be reading some tweets uh, you can get in touch with us on Twitter Richard N. James or I'm Jamie Anderson just uh, hashtag us with Jerry Anderson Podcast to make sure that we see it and uh, we'll read out whatever um, whatever tweets we see throughout the week so welcome to Pod24 but it's, it's rather a sad one this week Jamie isn't it it is yeah. and, it, and it's inevitable with um, the age of the shows we're talking about that the age of those who've contributed to them means that uh, uh, we are going to, to lose them, sadly. Yeah. Um, and rather sadly, this this last week before we're recording this podcast, Mike Noble passed away. Now, Mike was one of the, the key TV Century 21 comic artists. Yeah. And he was responsible for a huge volume of Fireball XL5, uh, Captain Scarlet, Zero X. He did some Space 1999 and lots of stuff outside of the Jerry Anderson universe, including Star Trek and many others. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so Mike, Mike passed away last Thursday. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be two Thursdays ago by the time the podcast goes out. Um, Mike was a lovely chap uh, and uh, a, a friend of the show, I think we can say, actually. Oh. Although uh, he, he never got to contribute directly. He, um, he was very aware of what we were doing uh-huh. with uh, the podcast and Great. bits and pieces. And he even uh, just heard recently about the Firestorm news and was very excited about that. Wow. So uh, it's a real loss. Um, he was a real lovely chap. And uh, I, I met him thanks to Lee Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, and last July, I was very lucky to spend a good few hours with Mike uh, at his bungalow, which was an amazing 1950s time warp. Oh, lovely. Uh, and we had a great chat there about all things Captain Scarlet and TV21. So yes. this week's interview section is going to be uh, excerpts from that chat. Great. Uh, and you'll hear all sorts of stuff from Mike. He's, he was such a, a self-deprecating type. Yeah. Uh, there were some really funny moments in there, lots of laughs. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, although it's very sad... Uh, I think Mike would have wanted us to keep things light and happy because yeah. he was a, a good old chuckler. Aww. So um, that's how we'll keep things with with, with banter, but yeah. uh, all due respect to Mike during yeah. the, uh, yeah. the interview section. Absolutely, what a contribution he made. I mean, if you're a fan of the Jerry Anson universe in any of its iterations, you know, particularly comics, obviously, you almost certainly would have seen. Uh, some of Mike's work and I know Lee Sullivan got to, to know him rather well in, in later years and to work with him as well which I know was he was absolutely thrilled about he did indeed and there'll be a bit on our website about that but I will read a short segment from Lee's tribute to Mike um, in the news section great lovely okay uh, so well with that shall we head straight over to the uh, newsy news 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 <sighs> it depends are you going to sing us in no I've got something big planned as you know Oh yes, of I've course. been I've been finding it difficult to, to find the time to do it. I'm, I'm a bit busy at the moment, but I've got a couple of days uh, at the end of this week, and uh, I think I might settle down to give you a, my my opus for the next right. uh, the next pod. Well, <laughs> I I look forward to that soon. But in the meantime, we'll just go with the standard news intro here, which will it's bound to be a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> that again, that's one sung. of our that's one of our reviews. <laughs> Okay. It's one of the kind of ones. Yes. Should Pod we just 24, go to, bound go, to be a disappointment. Should we just go to the news and stop <laughs> being self-deprecating I ourselves? Right, here it is then. Now. Hi, Gordon Tracy speaking. It's time for the Jerry Anderson News. Here we go. Well, as we mentioned, let's start off with that uh, sad news about Mike Noble, who's, yeah. uh, who sadly passed away last week. Um, lovely chap. And uh, I was introduced to him by Lee Sullivan, as you'll hear some uh, some chat with me and Lee and Mike in the interview section. Mm-hmm. But I just wanted to read a quick paragraph from Lee's tribute to Mike. We saw on the Jerry Anderson website. You can read the full thing there. Um, Lee says... His quest for improvement and experimentation was still evident in his 80s when we talked about my own move to digital art. 
He was extremely interested in the process uh, and he asked if it would be possible to perhaps combine some of his own longhand art with some, of, some digital art of mine. I assured, assured him that indeed we could do that, uh, all the time boggling at the prospect of working with him <laughs> and my own cheek at thinking I could live up to his standards. This resulted in our joint Zero X art print, which proved popular with the Anderson fans and led to our subsequent collaborations on two recent Captain Scarlet projects. The box art for the forthcoming Big Chief Studios Captain Scarlet 12 inch figure and a poster for the network Blu ray release of Scarlet. Both reference his famous TV21 cover Scarlet Deathfall. The poster was produced in his 87th year ah. in the nick of time, just before his health took a turn for the worse and art working became much harder for him. I'm so pleased those commercial commissions came along. It showed, uh, showed how much his work was still valued mm. um, and being part of them was one of the proudest moments in my career. Ah. Wow. Isn't that lovely? That's wonderful, isn't it? So oh, if you well want to read Lee. more of Lee's tribute, go to the Joe Anson website. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I, 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 almost, I wish that we had audio material for, for all the, uh, the Anderson cast and crew who passed away recently. Yeah. Um, Xenia Merton in particular, who we lost uh, just a couple of months ago. It would have been lovely to have some stuff with her. But since we've got it with Mike, we're going to flaunt yeah, it. that's um, great. And uh, I think he would have liked it in his own yeah, way. Yeah, absolutely. Very, I mean, he was really proud, I think, of his contributions. I mean, he's a very popular and uh, recurring figure on the convention circuit, I know, where, yeah. uh, where Lee would meet him very often. Yeah, he was. But he was always amazed by the fact there was this continuing love for, yeah. for his work. So, Isn't that sweet? That's great. Yeah. Anyway, what lovely chap. Yeah. Um, we've, we've also been celebrating some old stuff uh, with surviving actors and cast and crew. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mentioned it last time. Mm -hmm. I spent uh, last um, Saturday night oh, at yes. uh, the ITC day at Elstree. Yes, how was it? It was great. Yeah. I had a lovely time. Unfortunately, I had to run out halfway through because my last train was cancelled. Oh, you're joking. So I, while Shane Rimmer was on stage, oh, no. I, I had to duck through the crowds and disappear. Oh. Um, but it was lovely. So thank you to Rick of the Unmutual. And when he uh, got on stage, did he say, it. this is Shane Rimmer? <laughs> he didn't because no. he was already introduced. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I did a little turn on stage with Prentice Hancock and Georgina Moon. Oh, great. Um, which was great fun. And yeah. we did uh, record that. So that will become part of the ITC section whenever we do that in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, lovely. So uh, there you go. ITC Day was great. And hopefully there'll be more ones in the future. Yes. If you get a chance, do go along because I, I have a feeling everybody rather enjoyed themselves. Yeah, it sounded brilliant. Uh, on to retail. Oh, yeah. Bit of merch. Yeah, a bit of merch, you merch, you know, merch, merch, merch. A bit of merch. Uh, our Captain Black Friday event ends today, assuming uh -huh. you are listening today on Monday the 26th of November. Yeah. Um, if you haven't already picked up your goodies, then you're going to run out of time very no. shortly because at midnight tonight all the prices go up back to normal. But right now there are discounts between 40 and 90% off um, over 120 items. Amazing. So... Go and grab things for Christmas or for gifts for people in the future or for yourself. Um, yes, not to be repeated. And once things are out of stock, then that's it. They're gone. Yeah. So, uh, yes, hope you make the most of that Captain Black Friday event. Mm -hmm. I should be um, logging on, looking forward to uh, securing a pair of Officer Orin underpants. <laughs> I'm fascinated what the graphic would be on that and <laughs> how it would be laid out. But uh, let's not think too deeply on that. Uh, <clears throat> now, we've been asking you to t send in your ideas for merchandise, and a few of you have, but also I would like to hear from you as to what you want to see on the Jerry Anderson website, social media feeds, uh, YouTube channel, etc. Oh, yes. We're always trying to put out content that you're going to enjoy, um, but we can't always kind of read minds or guess, and actually sometimes it's quite nice to hear from you as to what you'd like to see. So <clears throat> if you want to see more top ten countdowns, um, more uh, top five articles on the website uh -huh. uh, if you want to see more clips uh, and analysis if you want to see I don't know famous fans reviewing their favourite episode Ooh, in yeah. a 45 second clip that would be great wouldn't it that so we could probably do fantastic. that with stuff from the podcast but yeah. let us know what you want to see um, if you're bored of seeing a particular thing then also let us know that or Although, listening to a particular thing I was going to say if it's that then maybe don't mention it but do let us know uh, in the most positive and um, <laughs> constructively critical way yes. uh, at podcast at jerryanson.co.uk. Uh, Space Precinct, Richard, I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, I hear it does ring a bell, yes. I mean, it was a show, I don't know, nobody really saw it and I don't think anybody, any good was in it. No, I think it was uh, just, well, I think it was me and this sort of nine-year-old boy <laughs> that I used to see walking about the uh, corridors of... Uh, 
I uh, would occasionally. I Did whatever was, happened to him? I'd probably, I don't know, yeah. nobody cares. There, there was such hope in his eyes at that age. I don't know. Yeah, and a full head of hair one? as well. <laughs> anyway, the Space Precinct complete DVD collection and soundtrack yes. are probably out now, we think, <laughs> although it's hard to tell because this is in the future and yeah. we're in the past right now. That's and, right. Oh, goodness yes. me, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but... If you want to grab a copy of the soundtrack that's signed exclusively by Crispin Morell and Richard James... Oh, yeah, now, I, now I can place it, yes. yes. Of Officer Orin ah, fame, That's right, yeah, I remember that. And now. what was the vampire character called? Oh, yes, I was in... Um, oh, Commander, his name was. Commander. That's and right. what was the... Um, oh, uh, what was the other thing? The 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 Creon. Um, oh, Bat I also Maddie? played Pike in an episode called Deadline, and yeah. uh, I was Co Barner in Illegal as well. Oh, there you go. All okay, those yeah. characters. So Richard played all those characters, and and Crispin did all the music. If you want yeah. a signed copy, uh, we've got about twenty odd copies left. Right. Um, well, at time of recording, we may not have it by the time it's out. So yeah. go grab one from the Jerry Anson store. Shop. Jerry Yeah. And finally. Oh yes. <laughs> Um, because today's been quite busy and I feel like I may have missed some news. Right. I'm just going to leave a short gap for me to insert any news that I've missed <laughs> now. Unfortunately, the bit of news that I missed uh, is another sad bit. Uh, John Bluthal has died. He was the man who voiced the gruff and efficient Commander Zero in the World Space Patrol in Fireball XR5. Uh, John was 89. UK listeners may also know him as Frank Pickle from uh, the Vicar of Dibley. John's agent said, it is with much sadness that we must let you know that legendary actor John Bluthal died on the 15th of November 2018 in New South Wales, Australia. He died peacefully in hospital, surrounded by loving family members following complications from a fall. He leaves behind beloved daughters, Lisa and Nava. Uh, so our thoughts and uh, condolences with John's family and friends, um, as well as Mike's. A sad week for news, I'm afraid. Thankfully, on a slightly brighter note, those of you who watched I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here over the last couple of weeks may have seen Anne Hegarty, also known as the governess from uh, The Chase, the ITV game show. Anne has autism, and uh, her announcement on the show and the response from her campmates led to a young boy called Joseph writing her a letter to say what a positive role model she was and how it gave him confidence because he was at a special school for autistic children. Um, Joseph also pointed out that he was a Thunderbirds fan and particularly loved Thunderbird 2. So we've made sure that Joseph gets uh, a Thunderbird 2 in the post and is welcome to join International Rescue any time. So not all down in the dumps this week, a little bit of positivity. Uh, you can see our tweets to Joseph on the Jerry Anderson Twitter account at Jerry Anderson TV. And now back to Jamie and Richard. Well, hopefully wow. there was no news there or, and I didn't miss anything. Or, or it was the best news ever. It was the best news ever, or it was just some other generic news that doesn't matter too much. Whatever that was in there, I hope you enjoyed it. And Richard, that is the end of the news. Hooray! Well done. Very good. <laughs> Lots of news there. Crikey, it's all go, isn't it? I know. Sorry, this is, but the, new, the news section gets ropier and ropier as I forget <laughs> what future and past news there is. Sorry. In the meantime, lots of people have been getting in touch with us uh, on Twitter uh, and uh, also on YouTube as well, where I know uh, Jamie posts the uh, the podcast. Um, we, are, we were asking if you've seen Firestorm, of course, Jerry Anson Firestorm, which is coming your way. Uh, 26 brand new uh, adventures filming uh, next year and beyond. Uh, Keith Gooch said, uh, glad to see the pilot minisode of Jerry Anderson's Firestorm has now been viewed 308,301 times on YouTube. Still rising every day. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, I recommend that they do so now. Uh, Nick said, uh, yes, he's seen it and he loved it. Emma says she's been there, watched it, bought the T-shirt. Uh, <laughs> and on YouTube as well, on the Firestorm HQ YouTube channel, you can see uh, lots of behind-the-scenes stuff, which is also going down really, really well. Uh, someone calling himself Trevor Random says, fab, love seeing behind the camera. Nige says, I've always had an interest in how things are created for film, so I'm loving these behind-the-scenes snippets. Thanks for sharing. And finally, Martin Drake, who's obviously of a rather technical mind, said, uh, glad you guys are using Codex. I was there when the system first launched, invited by SohoNet when I was working at MPC, when it launched alongside the Dalsa Origin camera. A beast. Definitely going to make a difference to the show going forward, I feel. 
Well, Martin, I only have your word for that because I have no idea what you were talking about. Niche, 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 niche. Very there. niche, absolutely. <laughs> so there are lots of interest in Firestorm, of course, which continues to make waves following its uh, its preview at uh, MCM Comic Con a few weeks back. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I should actually add on the Firestorm thing, Richard. Yeah. A, um, a fan in Japan. Yeah. Has done a full translation of the Firestorm minisode. Oh. Um, and those subtitles are available. Uh, on YouTube and I think on on Facebook as well now. Oh, great! So, uh, if you are a if you are a fan in Japan who is listening to this in English but wants to to read the, the subtitles in Japanese or can spread the word that they exist, yeah, please do so. We put a couple of tweets out to to, to let people know. But uh, you know, Michael House, who I think we're going yes. to hear from shortly, yes. If you're listening to this, do send out the link to your uh, Japanese acquaintances and chums yeah. because we'd love to spread the word out there as well. Yeah, wonderful. Great. Um, so, shall we? Um, let's hear from our lovely listeners, shall we? <laughs> our lovely listeners. Yes. <laughs> and we know it. they're out there because they keep emailing us. <laughs> Only because they we do. ask, of course. Yes. <laughs> and if you'd like your your listener email read out or to be referred to as a lovely listener, yes, then send it to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Uh, so we have an email here from Scott Sadler, who's been in touch to say, Hi again, Jamie and Richard. Fantastic news about the renewal of the licence for the Jerry Anderson store from ITV. Indeed it is. Mm. Uh, it gives plenty of items to look forward to seeing in 2019. With the holiday season around next month, would we have any chance of seeing any Christmas merch? A request of mine is a set of super marination themed baubles <laughs> with a Christmas tree. That could be rather fun, couldn't it? Could be interesting. <laughs> uh, also, I've been meaning to ask if it's possible and a nice idea for the Super Space Theatre releases to get a DVD release. These include the few like uh, Revenge of the Mistrons from Mars, Countdown to Disaster, The Incredible Voyage of Stingray and more. Although all the different episodes used for these projects are now available in all the originality and stunning quality, it's nice to relive for first-time fans from the 90s as they remember them from. Thank you, Scott Sadler. Uh, so what's that about then? What are the Super Space Theatre releases well, that he mentions there? I will tell you at any moment. I just have to uh, rescue the cat that just ah. got stuck in the cat flap. <laughs> so sit tight. I'll be back any moment. Richard, you can pad. Hang on. <laughs> the perils of podcasting. <laughs> Rescuing the cat from the cat flap. Well, at least we don't have to rescue Jamie from the cat flap. That would be a different matter entirely. <laughs> right. I'm back. Excellent. What's the news on the cat flap? Cat's fine now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy just wedged herself and then uh, it get happens. through the gap. And, oh, yeah. dear. Yeah. 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 Anyway, um, Super Space Theatre thinks, yeah, they were, video companies in the 90s and the 80s did a lot of this, didn't they, where they cut together or weirdly edited together episodes to sort of make a kind of mini-movie release. Ah. Oh. Um, and did all sorts of other bits and pieces to them. Um, I'm pretty sure that those aren't going to happen. Right. Um, because uh, the, the the demand for them will be pretty limited, yeah. and the work that will go into reconstructing them will be too great to make them commercially commercially viable. I might be wrong, yeah, um, but it wouldn't be up to us anyway. It would be up to ITV and Network to do those sort of things. Oh, I see. So put your request in there. You never know. Yeah, but my gut feeling is probably not. In yeah. terms of Christmas stuff, not this Christmas. That's uh-huh. for sure. A bit um, late. Bit yeah. Late in the day. Take, Especially getting something like baubles done. Yeah. You, we'd have to probably get them done, I don't know, by a specialist company, either yeah. here in the UK or abroad somewhere, which will take several months. Maybe. Um, it, it's just, it, it feels like such an unusual thing, but maybe people would really love it. I mean, yes. Scott clearly would. Yes. Would, you, would you have Jeff Tracy's baubles on your tree, Richard? I, I mean, be careful, but... Um... <laughs> Yeah, or any of the Tracy Brother baubles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could have a Lady Penelope on the top of the tree, couldn't you, as well? <laughs> that would work nicely. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I've, we, didn't we have last year Charlotte uh, 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 Bone? Charlotte Bone stuck um, various vehicles yeah, in her did. tree. she did. That's right. Yeah. She sent some pictures into us, didn't she? Yeah. That's right. Anyway, so make your own Christmas decorations for now, but we'll think about it for next year. <laughs> How's yeah, that? Yeah, um, ex- exactly. Actually, I'll just throw this in now. We yeah. are looking at the, p- the p- possibility of doing a Jerry Anderson 2019 calendar. Uh, it's all going to uh, be a bit last minute if it does happen. Yeah. Uh, would you Would you want one? Oh, if you come want on. One, tweet us and let us know. Yeah. Who wouldn't um, want that? Well, you say that, but, you know... I don't, I don't know. Oh, we I wanna, think so. I think you. so. I mean, it's such a rich 
legacy of stuff to draw on. You could find something, you know, for, for each month, surely. We could, yeah. Just a, a faff to put yeah. it together in time. That's yeah. the problem yeah, yeah. now. Of course. Because uh, we, we expected that others would do it because there have been Anderson car- um, calendars in the past, but uh-huh. um, they haven't they haven't appeared. Oh, so. okay. Anyway, okay. let's yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Richard, I've got an email here yeah. from Michael House in Japan. Oh, now he's uh, spoken to us previously, hasn't he? He did, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and he says, Gentlemen, thank you for choosing my email to read out on Pod 22. I take this opportunity to clarify some things I wrote in the previous message. Oh, yes. First, I've lived in Japan continuously and made my living as a Japanese-English translator since 1991. I know, how, know, however, that Naoko Mori is a native speaker of Japanese and it's only right to defer to her judgment of the questions about Japanese language over mine. Ah, yes. Now, Michael, there's, there's, no, there's no battle here. No. So this was about the pronunciation of Nagisa or Nagisa or Nagisa, Nagisa. From, yeah. uh, from Firestorm. Because we put Naoko Nagisa Mori. and yeah. I think Michael suggested Nagisa. That's right, yeah. Uh, and uh, Na- Naoko had gone with Nagisa, but yeah. I have a feeling she was doing that to... Uh, mimic what we'd already put in the minisode. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to find out from her. Yeah. Um, Michael goes on. Second, the Jerry Anson influence continues to make itself felt in Japan after all these decades, and while I've not heard anything reliable as of this writing on further consideration, it would surprise me if Firestorm did not air on Japanese TV in some form, possibly a satellite or cable channel, um, that would be a real achievement to be shown bilingually mm. on any of the Japanese terrestrial broadcast networks. Um, I haven't owned a t- TV for over a decade, however, wow. and thus I will most likely see it on DVD in any event. Ah. Uh, I apologise for co- causing any confusion with my previous message. Sincerely, Michael. Michael, there's no apology. No, needed. no, no. Absolutely um, not. Uh, that you might, my, my thing about Naoko is more of a, ooh, she yeah. said that. Well, I yeah. wonder why. But on consideration, <laughs> I reckon that's because she was trying to match what was already in the minisode yeah, because right. she recorded after everybody else. Uh, anyway, so, yeah. I will endeavour to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Michael. You are clearly a, a very valuable source of information. For Indeed. Us from Japan, uh, and, so thank I, you for writing in. And absolutely, I can I can quite see Firestorm finding a home on Japanese TV quite easily. Absolutely. Wouldn't well, we hope wonderful? so, don't we? Yeah. We hope so. Uh, I have um, one here. This is from Keys Conan, who says, Dear gentlemen... Uh, so, uh, so uh, not picking a side in the naming dispute I noticed there. Sensible, you sensible. Very often tussle over. Um, uh, still absolutely loving the podcast and Fab Live as well. Thank goodness for that. Uh, keep up the great work, he says. I'm assuming it's a he. I mean, could it be a she? Do you know, Jamie? I don't know, actually. That's terrible, isn't it? Keith Conan, that is terrible. I do apologise. Uh, and, of course, nothing but love from Firestorm as well, of course. I have a question and a product suggestion, and I'll start with the latter. In Pod 22, you guys mentioned that us listeners could send in suggestions for new products for the Jerry Anderson store. Indeed. We did. Yes. Uh, something I'd be interested in, and that's not really represented at the moment, here we go, Jamie, is a page-a-day type calendar for a complete year. Oh, I can imagine 2019 being pretty difficult to get done in the amount of time left, but I would love to buy a 2020 edition towards the end of next year. I have no doubt that you'd be able to fill it up with amazing pictures, facts, fibs and trivia about the Jerry Anderson world to brighten up every morning. I don't know if you'd fill it with fibs, would you? What would be the point in that? Well, you could put on the reverse or the following one, whether whether something was fab or fib, I guess, couldn't you? <laughs> I would also understand if I'm the only one excited about this. Well, well Richard, you sounded quite excited. Absolutely, yeah, that's two of us. Uh, my question is something that I've been wondering about for a while now. It's such a joy that we're still able to enjoy almost all the Jerry Anderson shows from back in the 60s, but I was wondering why virtually all of these shows were kept intact in the first place. As you probably know, many Doctor Who episodes from back in the 60s were thrown out after being shown, usually with the comment that reruns didn't exist at that time anyway, despite the fact that you mentioned on the podcast that reruns of Thunderbirds were on air as early as the 70s. And also, storing films was expensive, and it was very often reused as well. So I was wondering, why and how did the Jerry Anderson shows survive? Very glad they did, of course. I realise it's quite a nerdy question. Uh, not the nerdiest we've had, Keys, believe you me. But I was genuinely curious. Again, keep up the amazing work. Thank you very much. All the best, Keys Conan. That's very interesting, isn't it? How come we have so much of, uh, of the Jerry Anderson stuff left from the 60s and 70s? Well, first of all, Richard, can mm. I tell you something very important? Yeah. Keys is a masculine given name, common in the Netherlands, originally derived from the name Cornelis. Thank you very much. That's clear. So there that we go. Up. Thank you. Excellent. I mean, that's the main thing here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the calendar, we've already kind of covered that, haven't yeah. we? It would be great to do, yeah. but uh, a, a page a day might be even tougher than uh, just a, a wall calendar. Yeah. In terms of why, why it was kept and what was kept, 
And I think there's a couple of reasons. First thing is uh, the nature of BBC versus ITC. ITC being a privately owned company. Mm. Um, much more protective of their assets. Uh, whereas the BBC, a uh, public broadcaster, um, probably a little bit more concerned with uh, uh, cash yeah. and storage fees Costs, and all that, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. But of course the main reason is that uh, the majority of uh, the Doctor Who episodes were shot on video mm. and then edited on video and uh, videotape could easily be wiped and reused uh, and so as a kind of cost saving thing I think really that's what the BBC did they're uh-huh. just like oh nobody needs this junk it yeah film cannot be reused in that way um, and also the, I think just by its very nature at that time film was something much more precious Mm. You know, mm-hmm. um, it was it, it, you know it was associated with the cinema and uh, especially colour film in particular. Yeah. So uh, ITC were very good at protecting their assets, kind of uh, hoping that it might be able to be used in the future. Yeah. Keeping them for for duplication, so that uh, uh, prints could be made and sent around the world uh, if they were needed. So it's it's basically that really. It's it's the tape versus film thing is the main element. Now the only one that isn't included in that is Twizzle, yeah. Where fifty one of the fifty two episodes of on film are lost, yeah. And I don't know the the reason for that, yeah. Uh, really, other than it's just you know that wasn't a really old show. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's uh, kind of a rambled and not really very well answered. No, answer I think that's very good. You. I think that's very good. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because of course we often talk about you know lots of your, the older uh, stuff that your, your dad made and also Doctor Who. Of course, when they were making it, they had no idea that we'd be pouring over it in fifty years' time. When do you think no. they became aware that there was a sort of a commercial value? Because they obviously didn't think that at the beginning. They didn't think there was any commercial value to storing this stuff to keeping it. Uh, well, to release they, it in some form, I suppose they didn't even have a clue. In they what must form have had that would some be. some sense that that reshowing or reselling must be possible. Yeah, because they were, you know, even something like uh, like Twizzle and Torchy were being reshown in the early sixties. So yeah, they, so re, there was a concept of reruns, but yeah. not in uh, on the time scale that we're aware of it now. Sure, that's right. You know, I don't think they were thinking fifty years later. No. But we might as well keep this for ten years because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in in the case of Thunderbirds and those other shows, you know, the minute that Thunderbirds was being rebroadcast in the seventies, yeah, uh, obviously Lou and Co owned ITC, thinking, well, if that's being reshown, we might as well keep a lot of it because yes. the other shows might be reshown too. And how right they were, yeah, absolutely. But I don't, right. I don't think really any owner of the Jerry Anderson Library was aware of its value until nineteen ninety one when the BBC reshowed Thunderbirds, right. and then suddenly there was. All the shows being reshown and resurgence yeah. and merchandise, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that that level of resurgence and rerun was quite unexpected. I yeah. Think, I would think. And, and now we're in the position where almost every week there's something on somewhere. I notice Forces TV are showing UFO at the moment. Uh, so with our plethora of channels that we have, it's always worth searching through for for old Jerry Anderson stuff because you can bet you'll find it somewhere. Absolutely. And do email Forces TV and tell them you want to see more Anderson stuff because mm. now they've got that arrangement going with ITV yeah it opens things up for more yeah absolutely right so there we go fantastic and so if you would like to get in there, emails go on yes uh, yeah if you would like to get in touch with us for the, for the next pod uh, you can send your question or comment to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk uh, and we'd love to hear from you. Also, you can get in touch with us on Twitter, uh, Richard N. James, or I'm Jamie Anderson, and hashtag mm. us Jerry Anderson Podcast. Uh, Jamie often asks for some selfies. If you could post a picture of yourself listening to the podcast, wherever you may be, and tweet that, uh, we always enjoy seeing those. Jeff Owen got in touch with a picture of him sitting in his car. Uh, finally, he said, I'm up to date. He's listened to every podcast so far, just listening to Pod 22 while parked Hurrah. up, picking up girlfriend from work. Uh, here's the relevant selfie, and there it was posted. By the way, I was listening to the pod on Android's Podcast Republic. Definitely not iTunes. Yuck. Uh, <laughs> but actually, you're free to listen to the podcast wherever you wish, of course. We're on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. and uh, uh, But yes, Podcast Republic, where uh, Jeff also left a lovely five-star review saying, Fab Podcast for all Jerry Anderson fans. P-W-O-R. Oh, What's that? Price on application or something, isn't it? 
proceeding with orders oh. received, oh, Richard. Right, yes. Good. And of course, Josh Long, who gets in touch with us uh, uh, very regularly on Twitter, said, What a treat to have the talented uh, Nicholas Briggs on the Jerry Anderson podcast this week. And always a pleasure to listen to those splendid chaps, Jamie Anderson, Richard James, and the fantastic Chris Dale. Uh, featuring a cameo from Captain Scars himself, yes, on the randomizer last week. Yes, yeah, so indeed. thanks for getting in touch on Twitter. We love to read your tweets and uh, we'll read them out if we spot them. We will. Yeah. <laughs> and your reviews and your other bits and pieces and emails and everything else. Yes. I suppose, I mean, uh, one thing I have neglected to say this week, I think, so far. What? Rate, share, review. Hmm. Yeah. I thought you were going to say. No. That. The other one. <laughs> are you saving that, or are you I'm gonna, gonna save s- that for a more. You're gonna rest moment. it for this week. <laughs> yeah, I think exactly. you should rest it this week. Um, <laughs> so yes, anyway. do if you can. Uh, rate us uh, on whatever platform you're listening to us on. Give us a share. Uh, give us a review, uh, and let us know what you think. That would be great. Thanks, gang. Yeah. Uh, now, Richard, shall we move on to our lovely little tribute section to, oh, yes. to dear Mike Noble? Yes, let's do that. This is from a conversation last July, July 2017, between me, Lee Sullivan, and Mike Noble at Mike's lovely home, uh, when we were uh, Lee brought down a load of um, of comic panels that he owned, and we talked through the way Mike got into uh, TV21, what he was doing beforehand. Uh-huh. Um, he showed us some stuff from his sort of private collection of his own little sketches, all sorts. Wow. Um, and then we sat down and uh, and tried to make Mike um, admit how brilliant he was, but he wouldn't <laughs> quite do it. So, uh, yeah, his little selection. And apologies, I was at the end of a chest infection last July. Would Uh-oh. you believe it? So it's full of coughs, which I cannot edit out. Um, the sound quality is a bit variable because it was recorded all around Mike's house, uh, mostly around his living room, but we were sort of sprawled across various enormous pages from TV21 and beyond. Yeah, great. So um, here it is, our little tribute to Mike Noble. On the 17th of July 2017, I visited Mike Noble's home uh, with a chum of mine, Lee Sullivan, who some of you may know. Uh, if you don't know him, go and have a listen to him in one of our earlier pods, I think pod four. I turned up at Mike's house, and on the gate, he'd pinned a lovely picture of uh, Captain Scarlet, Captain Blue and Lieutenant Green. Mike gave us a great welcome, looked after us very well and we had a great pub lunch. Part of this interview was recorded for Big Finish Productions' Captain Scarlet 50th Anniversary box set. Uh, but I'm presenting the full chat uh, here with Lee and Mike. Uh, and then I've also got some other uh, more informal chatter where Mike tells a couple of stories. Um And we end on a note which is particularly poignant, really, I think, because Mike was so self-deprecating. We end with Mike taking a compliment as an insult, essentially, and uh, and having a good laugh about it. So here it is. It's a bit of a random selection, but uh, I'm so glad we've got it. Here is a chat with Lee and Mike. My name is Mike Noble, and uh, I spent quite a lot of my youth doing drawings of uh, Jerry Anderson's wonderful shows, uh, Fireball XL5 being the first, uh, going on to Zero X, Captain Scarlet, and various other things, Space 99 in the latter years. Uh, and enjoyed it all very much, yes. Perfect, Mike. And who the hell are you? Uh I am Lee Sullivan, and uh, I'm a comic strip artist. But uh, and in my youth, I spent a lot of it reading Mike Noble's uh, fabulous strips in uh, TV Twenty One with Fireball and all those things, and uh, uh, it led left a a really strong impact on me, and still does because uh, it, it influences what I do, and is a constant reminder of where I'm going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't he nice? Yes. Sort yes. of. Little it's, does uh, he know I'm no benchmark. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but you see, I, it depends how high you think I am. <laughs> oh, well, no, I'm, there. I, I'm considerably lower than no, you. Are. No, no, no. No, I insist. No. I'm lower, much lower than no, you. No, no. Your uh, <laughs> expertise in the graphics world of computers and artwork is something which I would know very little about and it's an expertise which I know you are very good at. 
Well, that's very kind of you to say. So we've actually worked together on a, on a Zero X. We have. Because you were, despite uh, our, our um, combined great ages, uh, uh, you dis- when we were talking about the digital stuff that I do, you were kind of curious about it and wanted to see what your work would look like blended with the digital effects. And so we did a piece together where I d- you did the, the really good foreground and I did the rather less good background in digital form. And, uh, <laughs> well, it was a galaxy. I think it was part of the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. And I thought, what better way of doing it than through the graphics computer because it it was much more flexible, certainly more pliable and you could use quite a lot more imagination. So the contrast between the two styles I think is something which is quite unique Mm. in the comic strip world yes i think it was certainly it was certainly unique from my point of view what i really sale, love sale sale <laughs> <laughs> these are available from uh, the anderson website <laughs> remember that folks zero x that's what you want to be looking for anyway uh, but um but the, the, the process of that was quite funny though because i would do my digital background and i would get a print made of it and send it off to mike because he has no email, so it was we had to we had to do things the old fashioned way and the new way in a combination all the way through. And then I would get them. He would very kindly send them back with some amendments, and he would paint a little washes of colour over areas and say, "I think it would be quite nice if it was like this." I think, oh god, I thought I, I really thought, I'd, and I'll, I wouldn't have taken it from anyone else, you know. <laughs> if it wasn't Mike, I'd have said, "That's you've got what it, you've got what I've done there." But no. A wonderful friendship might have ended there, you know. <laughs> might have ended there. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't be more thrilled to have worked with you and, and to do it again with the Scarlet, the Captain Scarlet, um, uh, the big Chief Studios uh, figure is a real treat. And, uh, and to get a co credit, that's, that's, I, I would have bribed people for that job. In fact, I did. Well, as I say, uh... I'm getting pretty ancient anyway, and uh, my output is very limited now. Uh, So anything that I turn out that can be enhanced, I'm very grateful for. Yes. Yes. Well, this has turned into a right loving, hasn't it, the two of you? (laughs) Shall I go and leave you to it? (laughs) It's a bit mawkish, is it? That's why we don't normally sit on the sofa together. I know, I... (laughs) <laughs> I might separate you in a moment. Um, yes. <laughs> you give a different background. <laughs> and then Mike can rework the background for you. Yeah, that's right. Because it's yes. not good enough. It's not quite the right colour, that, you know. Um, Who's this then? Who's this guy? <laughs> Some greedy ball bloke. Uh, you might mistake him for me. Uh, how did you? How did you? I know you got. Obviously, you've been involved in the TV Twenty One for st- stuff for a long time, um, and Scarlet was quite different. What What was the process for you getting the call up to do Scarlet? Was it just right? You're off that project now, Mike. You're onto this new thing called Scarlet. Here's a sheet of pictures. Go. Yes, I I followed orders. It was as simple as that, really. It was as simple as that. And I was intrigued, of course, because I'd seen uh, Ron Elmerton's Captain Scarlet, uh, uh, some of his, uh, you know, early work there, and uh, admired it. Uh, So I I felt quite comfortable when I undertook the job because... um, I could put my own version to it, my own style of drawing. And by that time, there was great opportunity to do a lot of action figures, which I quite enjoyed. I yeah. used to get the scripts either from Alan Fennell or from Angus Allen, but neither of them put their signature on the script, so... It was quite difficult to tell t'other from which. Nevertheless, I must say the calibre of writing was such that it used to fire my imagination up so well that I think it helped enormously in the artwork. Perfect. 
didn't, I, didn't, I, I thought they would have put their names on it. I'm surprised about that. No, it's, You're surprised? Yes. Well, yes. one of the strange things really about that time was that nobody had credits on anything. No. So I don't, didn't know Mike's name for, for the donkey Nobody series. knew who the lettering artists were. They changed. They're still looking for them. <laughs> yes. They've never been paid. No. <laughs> no, they were a bit of the Cinderella bit of the job, I think. Yes. Mm. Pity, really. I think, I think actually, but I don't think, the, <coughs> I don't think the script writers got the credit, anything like uh, what uh, the artists received. And since you received none, that was <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a statement. <laughs> <laughs> I received even less than you did. From my point of view, it was so important to have a good script. And I believe Ron Embleton, in the early days of Express Weekly, when he used to do Wolf the Britain, I think he used to write the scripts. And they were stories of the ancient Britons when the right. Romans occupied this country. And I've never, ever come across a similar situation where the illustrator also wrote the storylines. That's a hell of a workload, isn't it? Yes, yes. Although you can cut it's down on those terrible that, things in the script. It? Yes. Mm. Fine, lovely. Uh, you said you said earlier on, Mike, that you, you were filling in the gap where the TV stuff left off. I would just like the two of you to talk about that, as you as a reader, obviously, because mm. the TV run was so limited for Scarlet. Mm. Was it important? To you to be able to extend your enjoyment beyond that into the TV21 comics? Mm. Well, the TV21 comic was, I think what the, the great thing about it was that it, it extended uh, the universe of, uh, of any of the, stri- of any of the, um, the series. It, it particularly helped with Scarlet, I think, because Scarlet was quite short-lived. Um, it, it didn't seem to have had the same run as Thunderbirds. I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it seemed that way. Also, it was a much shorter episode. Um, and so it was kind of limited in what it could do. And I think also the technical the technicalities of making it had become so much more. There, there were limitations as to what they could kind of uh, describe. And the, it was very important. The, the TV Twenty One was very important to followers of, of Jerry Anderson's work because it extended those things, and it also actually tied them together. There were several crossover stories where you would have uh, Fireball turning up in a in a one of the other series, and uh, that happened particularly, I think, with Stingray as well. That all of those, uh, I think, apart from Supercar, they were all actually inhabiting the same universe. And so you had, you did have the potential for crossovers and actual crossovers as well. I think there was a problem there, though, because we were working six weeks ahead of publication and there was no way I knew what Ron Embleton was doing with my characters any more than he was doing with mine. Uh, so... I think it was fraught with problems and I think they did abandon it in the end. Yeah. I think it was too difficult. (laughs) How can we make this more complicated and unnecessarily difficult? It was an experiment. Uh, uh, I don't know whether it had ever been done before, but I don't know. And as far as the Captain Scarlet strips were concerned... um, It was quite ambitious from a puppet's point of view to do the physical activity that Captain Scarlet was expected to do. I think there was a a, a, a real strain on the capabilities Mm. of puppetry, although I know not how it was actually run. As far as I was concerned as an illustrator, it was oath, it was quite fine with me because you you can conjure up anything when you're an illustrator, but certainly not in film work. 
as far as I could see. Mm. That was my humble opinion anyway. <laughs> and I think just to, just to round things off, uh, looking back at your Captain Scarlet work, Mike, how do you feel about it on reflection? Because you did pull some cringy faces earlier on when you were look, thinking about the earliest stuff on Fireball in particular. Are you, are you proud of it? And then Lee will swiftly follow it up by cancelling out any self-deprecation that you do. So, <laughs> <laughs> When I first started with, uh, as you say, with Fireball XL5, the artwork that I produce, I thought was OK, uh, quite satisfied until I saw the reproduction. And then to my, uh, well, dissatisfaction, shall I say, the line work, the black ink, was too predominant over the colour which came as quite an unexpected feature. It was that that made me think twice about line work with colour. And I adapted my style to accommodate that problem. And I also learned a great deal from my contemporaries, I must admit. Yes. Well, you can see from... um... From the early uh, Fireball XL5 work, uh, even just through that run, your work uh, improves massively. Um, but it, it has to be said, it starts from a very high level and then goes upwards. Whereas, you know, some of us are still aspiring to the early stuff. <laughs> well, if they think, I'm quite happy to live with that because. <laughs> I I had a much lower opinion of my work, I can tell you, (laughs) now. (laughs) And uh, certainly gratified that people were getting enjoyment from it from the word go. Yeah. Uh, Was it uh, Alan Shelbourne? Well, I think was the editor at that time. And... uh, Angus Allen was there, and we sat in this cinema and watched some of a couple of stories, oh, you know, right. famous five, just to get the flavour of it and everything. Did you ever get that with the uh, Jerry Anderson stuff? Did you no, ever no, 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 no. So you didn't, didn't even get the colour work for the. Well, of course, Fireball XL5 went out in black and white, mm-hmm. didn't it? And well, I was doing it in colour, so I never did. I had to wait six weeks to find out what colour this, that and the other was. Mm. You know, I had to phone up and say, what colour so-and-so, what so-and-so. Yeah. Well, it's all, it all came out very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think XL5 was... Was really a silver craft. Yes, you rather famously painted it as a goldy but, colour. Didn't that's you? right. And the reason I did that was that the first issue I saw that came out on the front cover was goldy colour. Yeah, yeah, lighting. Yeah. So, so uh, your whole uh, I rest <laughs> my whole, case, my your, lord. Your whole run of fireball is a completely different colour. But I didn't front. get any any adverse comments about it. Well, the thing is, it was it the, well. The photographs on the front were great um, and, and rather surprising to to. to so what the made them that coppery? Well, you know that colour. Well, I suppose that what well, what happened? I think was that it was there was a cast to the photograph that you saw, and and that's how it came out. I mean, that happens with the pictures of the Daleks. You know, there's there's quite a lot of photographs of the Daleks from the Dalek movies to mm. tie in with the Dalek strip that was in. TV twenty one yeah. at the time, um, and it was my impression that the the Daleks the bl- the drone Daleks were blue with blue helmets and and, and uh, mm. blue hemispheres and a blue base, but that the actual body of them was also blue. It looks very blue in in the photographs, and it's not; it's silver. Yeah. So it's just a cast process and the yes. print process. You get you arrive at that different color. Yes. Mm. Oh, I know this stuff. Either. But isn't it odd, <laughs> that? Isn't it odd? Yeah. yeah. 
But that's funny that you you kind of ran with it, and 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 it was forever. Well, I was. Color. It was unbelievable how in the dark I was when I started Fireball XL Five. I really. Had you actually seen the program? At no, all? no, nothing, nothing. <laughs> you think they would show him a episode or something? But... <laughs> Isn't it extraordinary? Yeah, we wouldn't do that now. No, you no, get no. a brand guide and a oh, Bible yeah. and you know endless. I mean, when I started doing Follyfoot Farm, Alan said to me, he said, "Well, you must come up." to Yorkshire and have a look at the set and watch the actors and get the atmosphere. And I thought, cool, that's a revelation. I wonder if I could, you know, do that. And did you? Never got the... No, oh. that was the last I heard of it. What a swizz. And I, I thought, well... And then they said, well, <laughs> first double spread in... You know, in ten days' time. That's right. And I thought, thanks <laughs> very much. You'll never get the time to go to Yorkshire. No. Right? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. Yeah. And the only time I did get to a television studio was when I started Time Slip. Yeah, I was going to mention Time and Slip. And I went. To, I was invited then to go down to Elstree and watch the. The youngsters working on the on the strip there, you know, and yeah, and that was, and I did sketches of a couple of them, wow. and I later on, I met them at a convention, and Cheryl, welcomed me with open arms. She remembers it, you know. Yeah. Oh, Michael, you know, it's the first time I'd seen her since, uh, you know, I'd been to Earl Street. Well, you have that effect on women, you know, Mike. It's just for the show, you know. <laughs> Especially if he's wearing his leather gloves. Especially with the gloves, yeah. <laughs> I must have been wearing gloves. <laughs> but Time Slip was fantastic because, uh, I mean, it was a great series. It's a really uncompromisingly bold series, I think, for children's TV. But it, your strip, it must have been great to work on because you got to work on because they did properly go back in time to Romans mm. and all kinds of stuff. Had a they? whole variety of places, yes. Yeah. Did the really Great enjoyed... Fire of London. Yeah. And did all those old houses, you know, the Tudor houses with the overhang, you know. I did enjoy that, yes, yes. Fusiliers rushing around with flintlocks, yes. God, yeah. No, Dragoons, Dragoons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And who is it you did the uh, um, uh, the Charles of the Light Brigade? Oh, that was for an annual. All right. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whose annual I did that for. Uh, I've never seen any reproductions of it since. No. It went... It's a funny thing, isn't it, that you, as an artist, <coughs> you quite often don't get things sent to you when they come out. If you, no, unless you can, no. you're even aware that they're out there, you might rush out and buy a copy. Yeah. I used to, when I was working in the Radio Times doing Doctor Who, I, God, I thought, this is great. I'm, I was so pleased to be working. The Radio Times was a massive circulation at the time, something like four or five million yeah. copies per week and uh, I used to run out and buy 10 copies of each one <laughs> <laughs> in my loft there's about 10, really? ti 10 times 40 episodes Gosh. worth of tea and after a bit that seemed okay for the first couple of weeks and by the end of it I was thinking oh what have I done so I've got boxes and boxes of things upstairs all mouldering away I should think loved. your archive's pretty pretty extensive as it is isn't it, it was... well I've had no complaints yeah the thing is that one of the things that Mike has done consistently when we've been talking about this stuff is that his storytelling is is exactly that. You're actually getting characters describing the action, being involved in the action, but also describing the action. So all their gestures and facial expressions and their, the way they're leaning into the drawing, leaning into each other or opposing each other. or it, it, it's It's part of the... The process of doing storytelling and it's yes it, it, it 
you can do it. It's obviously important in any illustration, but with, with comic strips, there's also a, a flow from one drawing to the other, and the actions in one lead to the actions and reactions in another, and you're terribly good at doing that. Well, I've tried to avoid people looking wooden, <laughs> uh, and, you know, all upright and... Especially the puppets. Yeah, you've... You've, yes, you've got, well, you, I thought that the puppetry was world-breaking, no, really, it, it because marvelous. it was so much more flexible than the stuff I'd seen yeah, before. Yeah. But when an, uh, when I was invited to do the strips, I, I think I've said this before, but I said to Alan, look, um, Obviously, as an illustrator, I can do whatever I like as far as movement and walking, running, expressions are concerned. I say, how much uh, leeway do I have? So he said, well, as long as you can keep the faces of the characters the same as on the television, as long as you don't go too <laughs> mad, <laughs> he said... Uh, make them uh, real people. That's very interesting, because when I took on Thunderbirds, I did five years of Thunderbirds, and that was for a younger age group than, than TV21. But they were very, there was a sort of concern that they should look both like real people and the puppets. And it was a bit of, a, bit of a, a game trying to get them between difficult. the two. Yeah. That's difficult. I, I mean, I, I noticed with um, uh, Frank Bellamy that um, he would do a couple of heads talking to one another, a circle in the background and, <laughs> and these almost um, chess pieces yeah, yeah. speaking to one another because the neck and the head and the, and the forage yeah, cap yeah. were all in line and it was a, a pup, couple of puppets talking, you know. That but then again, a couple of frames later, they were... Running around like two yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That's uh, that. I think that he, um, his portraiture of the of the puppets was good, but it was also it, it was quite stiff, wasn't yeah, it? It was quite yeah. It was quite stiff. It was sort of rugged, yeah, square. Yeah, that's right. Now the face is very square. There's a wonderful thing. Good about... lighting effects. Mm. Yeah. There's a wonderful thing about your work because everybody has a style, and you have a style. Your style is very obvious. Um, and what is fascinating is that there is a way that you draw faces, I and mean, we all have this. Every artist has got a way of drawing faces, and it's yeah. it, it's actually quite hard to manoeuvre out of the way you would naturally draw something to accommodate the way people actually look. Mm. But, there, but, the, but the interesting thing that always I always loved about your work was that there's a common visual theme between Captain uh, between Steve Zodiac mm. and uh, the guys in Zero X, mm. and even when you come to draw Star Trek, you can still see a little of Steve Zodiac in Captain <laughs> Kirk's face. <laughs> yes. I think that's lovely. It's, <laughs> it's all that they are all good portraits, but they are, and you can see who they are. But there is also a linking yes, structure to yes, them, which is yes. you. And I think I've always found that very interesting. I think, yes, one of my weaknesses was that some of the characters that I drew weren't original enough. Because people are so different than mm. the way they look. Mm. And I could have made more of a variety out of some of the characters, I think. But you're also pulled to do things the way you do them, aren't you? That yes. A, it's yes. very hard to escape that, really. Yes, yes. He doesn't agree at all. No, <laughs> I like the way yes, Mike, Mike turned a compliment yes. into an insult there. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does it very well. Yeah, Lee says there's this really lovely way that all of your, your hero characters are linked, Mike, something really distinctive, it's really strong. <laughs> well, it's one of my weaknesses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Other people pay quite a lot for that weakness, you know. Well, what a lovely man. Yeah, how lovely. And very self-effacing as well. It's quite a sweet quality, isn't it? Unendingly. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, Lee, Lee always tried to get him to sort of say, 
okay, yes, I, I did I admit all right, it. but he, he, he couldn't he couldn't do it, um, which is very very sweet. But that day we had a really lovely pub lunch, Ooh. Um, off next to a cricket field, a little oh. drive away from Mike's place. Yeah, um, and he made us lots of cups of tea, and Great. He was, he was such a nice host. And when I turned up. He'd gone outside and pinned a picture of Captain Scarlet, uh, Captain Blue, and Lieutenant Green to his gate, um, which I've got a picture of and I shall put online. Oh. But uh, I've got a really nice photo of me, Lee, and White from that day, which I shall always treasure. Yeah, um, such lovely. a such a lovely chap. So there you go. Great, and, um, and I suppose you know, obviously. Uh, w- w- Anyone who's interested, how will we? How can we see the work of Mike Noble? Have you got anything on the website, or I guess we can Google search, or yeah, there's there, we've got some bits and pieces on the website. Yeah, um, but lots of his art is all over the place, scanned everywhere. Yeah, uh, and there are various TV Twenty One books uh, on you can get online, sure. eBay, etc., where Mike's uh, stuff is on display. And it's also worth looking on YouTube for Mike Noble because Chris Thompson mm-hmm. um, of uh, T-shirt designing, animating, video editing fame. Yes. Uh, uh, did an interview with Mike a number of years ago, uh, so there's some nice stuff about him there. Great, very so, nice. Yeah, do go looking, and yeah. um, our, our condolences and very best wishes to Mike's family and friends. Yeah, indeed, indeed. What a lovely man. Uh, well, that was, that was fantastic, and of course there are many other interviews uh, to choose from in uh, in our previous podcast. So uh, don't forget to subscribe so that you get a notification each time uh, a new episode drops. Um, we, I feel like we always tend to mention the same people, don't we, when we talk about people we've interviewed? And I was thinking, yes. can we pick people to mention now that we haven't mentioned before? And I'm going to go for one first, and then we'll see how you do. Hang Phil on. Plate. <laughs> we've definitely mentioned him before, haven't we? Well, we tend to mention your Wayne Forresters and your Shane Rimmers and your Don't Chris mention Packham's them now! And your Sophia Miles and your Sophie Aldreds, don't we? Yeah, all right. Well, how about we go for Mike Tucker, then? Oh, God, that's a good one, yeah. That's a we great don't say Mike him. Tucker. That's really good, actually. Crikey, um, I'm going to go for um, I'm going to go for Nicholas Briggs. Okay, well that's just been that's an easy one. Um, we've got the double the double bill of McKinnon and Saunders talking yes. about puppet development. That's quite an interesting one, an unusual yes. one. Yes, that's right. Any more? Uh, oh, Shane Rimmer. Yeah, we do mention him occasionally, don't we? Yeah, um, but it's funny how we sort of settle into the same old uh, you know half a dozen yeah. names when actually there's a whole host, a galaxy of stars to catch up on in the previous podcast. Well, I'll tell you who there is, Richard. Go on. <clears throat> Shall we run through it very quickly? Yeah, go on. Two parts of Sophia Miles. Yeah. Lee Sullivan, Sophie Aldred, Gary Newman, oh, yeah. David Graham, yeah. Lizo Mazumba, yeah. Tim Beddows from Network Distributing, Chris Packham, part one and two, mm-hmm. uh, McKinnon and Saunders, part one and two, yeah. uh, Shane Rimmer, Mike Tucker, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, yeah. David Quantic. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, Andrew James Spooner, the puppeteer. Yeah. Uh, two bits on Firestorm, celebration of Parker's name, uh, oh, yes. King's Arms, yes. and Nick Briggs from last week. There we go. What, a, what an amazing galaxy yeah. of stars. Isn't that great? <laughs> so go back and listen to one or all of those if you haven't already. Exactly. There's an awful lot of And if you have... Them. Thanks. Yeah. What's great is that it's a kind of a, it's a look at the Jerry Anderson universe from a from a sort of a multitude of different angles. People who've worked with Jerry, or people who have been a fan of his work, or uh, people who are working on new stuff. Because as we know, Jamie, I think it might be time to say, uh... it, there's brand new Jerry Anderson stuff happening right now. Thank you, Richard. Isn't that Lovely. true? Uh, great. It is fantastic. True. So, um, well, look, I think it might be time <laughs> to to move on to to Chris Dale's randomizer. Now, uh, on Twitter I earlier, so. I saw that someone had asked Chris. Um, which of the uh, Jerry Anderson series he has yet to uh, be subjected to by the randomizer. And he gave us mm. a list of uh, Twizzle, Fireball XL5, The Secret Service, UFO, The Investigator, The Protectors, uh, Series 1 of Space 1999, The Day After Tomorrow, The Space Police Pilot, uh, Dick Spanner uh, and Lavender Castle. So there's still mm. quite a few to get through. There are indeed. Um, and I, I had a chat with Chris today as well and we reckon we should try and record a... Uh, a randomizer with you, me, and Chris when we get together in a couple of weeks' time. Oh, that's a great idea. That'll be fun, won't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Chris is going to be joining us for our next Fab Live, which I think is uh, December the third, Monday evening at seven o'clock on uh, on our Jerry Anderson Facebook page. Um, so that'll it's be our fun. Christmas special, isn't it? Christmas it's special. <laughs> a Christmas special. Oh, hey. oh nice. Because we had Terry Christmas last year, of course, didn't we, with Terry Adlam? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Got, we're gonna have, be going to find it rather tough to get. Uh, yeah. Yes, who only fit with Christmas puns, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. But for now, it's two out of two with Terry yeah, Christmas exactly. and Merry for Christmas. For now, we're winning. <laughs> uh, right, should we go on to Chris doing a solo randomizer? Yeah, go on then. All right, here he is. Marina. 
Marina! Where has that girl got to now? Oh, hello everyone. Well, as you can probably hear, I can't find Marina. We've landed our eagle on this weird pink planet that she was quite eager to explore, only now she's wandered off by herself and I can't... Aha! There she is! Marina? Marina, what is it? What's... Marina? Hello? Anybody home? Well, this is a pickle. Oh, hello. Welcome to Piri. Oh, Piri. Yes, that would explain it. Oh, dear. I have come like this in human form, so that you may understand my presence. Are you afraid of me? No, no, no. I... I just want to know what you've done to Marina. That is the will of the Guardian. Her nerves are relaxed. Her appetites are swaged. The struggle is over. And you can join her in paradise. Ah, that. Uh, well, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, if you'll just release Marina, we'll be on our way. By your presence in our universe, you have disturbed the peace of pity. You must be made fit to live here. That is the Guardian's directive. No, 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 it's very kind, but... Perfection is absolute. You must be made perfect. Well, listen, firstly, making me perfect would be a very long job. And as for Marina, well, I... I thought she was jolly well perfect as she was, actually. The Guardian could make the process so much easier for you. Easier? Yes, all right. Look, I'll make you a deal. I'll go along with this if you make the selection on the randomizer this week. I mean, if I'm here forever and this is going to be the last spin, then we really need to go out on something pretty special. And who better than a perfect being such as yourself to make that selection for us? Assuming the Guardian hasn't already sabotaged the randomizer, of course. Your computer was not sabotaged. It was merely taken over for the Guardian's use. Its mind was most nearly perfect. Oh, of course it is. Right, there's the printout. There you go. What does it say? <laughs> oh, easy, Marina, easy. I've got you. That's it. Are you all right now? OK, good. What happened? Well, of course, you and I both know that the randomizer is full of wonderful things, but is also capable of producing great evil. I merely reasoned that if that girl selected an episode that was anything less than perfect, it might just be enough to break the Guardian's hold over you. I wasn't expecting her to collapse like that. It must be something pretty bad for that to have happened. And unfortunately, I think I know there's only one show that could produce that reaction. Pass me the printout, will you? Oh, I did this for you, you know. OK, let's get back to the eagle and get it over with. Let's watch Torchy Gets Stolen. Still, at least it sounds like it'll have a happy ending. Torchy! Torchy! You know how many Thunderbirds episodes we've watched on the randomizer so far? One. You know how many episodes of the original Captain Scarlet we've watched on the randomizer so far? One. You know how many UFO episodes we've watched on the randomizer so far? Zero. Here we are on our third, third episode of Torchy the Battery Boy. Um, it's 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 good to get them out of the way. I would, uh, I would. I, I dream of a day where there's no more Torchy in the randomizer. What's this episode? Torchy is stolen. Um, this is episode... This is episode 12 of Torchy, out of the 26 that we're watching. So evidently he's not stolen for very long, unfortunately. Somebody brings him back. star with Torchy the Battery Boy. When Pom Pom and the toys were blown into the air by the wind, I made a battery boy to keep me company. But he flew up to the twinkling star in a rocket and only comes down to see me now and again. Oh dear, I do feel miserable by myself. Well, you are miserable by... Oh, the torchy death beam has got him in its sights. Splendiferous! It's Torchy's magic beam! <laughs> I've got to hide in the cellar before he finds me! Yes, I am, Mr. Bumblebee. 
Snowdrop. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and I miss you too. Why don't you come down right away? <laughs> I'm already in my rocket. Can you say suicide run, Mr. Bumbledrop? Can you say kamikaze? I know you could. Oh no, no more singing. What on earth is this? I will find the biggest star that twinkles very bright. Uh, you do realise your co-pilot on this mission is a poodle. You should probably be doing more important things than singing. And the clouds are raised. I will start to count the stars as I zoom out into space. And keep zooming, please don't come back to Earth. Keep going, never return. Oh, I'm looking at Torchy's ear there. He has, there's no hole, there's no like eardrum or anything. It is just a flap of flesh hanging on the side of his head. Oh, that's chilling. That's uh, one more piece of horror to add to the pile. And Torchy and Pom Pom were stepping out of it. Dear Mr. Bumble Wumble Drop, how lovely to see you. <laughs> and it's wonderful for to see you and my darling. And I'm always amazed and I suppose slightly impressed with this show how how dense the continuity seems to be. We're jumping around this continuing storyline. Uh, I haven't seen too many of the later episodes of the show. I wonder if they, they managed to keep that up. What have we got? Uh, there's meat stew for us and some dog biscuits mashed in milk for Pom Pom. Pom Pom doesn't like dog biscuits. On Topsy Turvy Land, she only chews crispy, crunchy bones and meatballs covered in chocolate sauce. Uh, is that so nice? And uh, what animals in Topsy Turvy Land provide those bones on which she. No, never mind. I don't want to know. I don't want to know what. Poor creatures in uh, Topsy Turvy Land are being slaughtered to feed Pom Pom. Bum, bum. No, no, sit. No, 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 no. Sit, I say. Yeah. And don't growl at me either. Oh, my goodness. She's becoming a spoiled poodle. Sit down. Becoming? She already was. D didn't you used to, like, manicure her, her paws from the first episode? They sat down by the fire. I do wish you and soon it caught Torchy and they both burned alive and the series was over. Only in my dreams. Not now. I have a lot of things to do in the house. <laughs> I have a lot of sitting in this chair complaining to do. It takes up most of the day, unfortunately. ...and taught her how to behave herself. She's been very good indeed. And she lets all the children play in my garden. Even though you didn't bring back the other toys. I'm glad Bossy Boots is good. It makes the paddling and the beatings all worth it. Uh, Mr. Bumbledrop, she doesn't like coming down to Earth, you know, because she can't talk properly down here, and it makes her cross. Uh, well, all right, Torchy. It's a litter in. Come on, Pum Pum. Push the door with your nose. <laughs> no, no, no. Stop licking me and sit down. <sighs> How good it is to have you two back again. Well, no, just really the dog. I'm not too bothered about Torchy, in fact. <laughs> I'm going to do some shopping, Torchy. Is there anything I can get for you? Oh, oh, some napalm and some knives and some more uh, fireworks and uh, anything that is 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 illegal and dangerous. I will have lots of it, please. If your battery stopped working, because then you wouldn't be able to walk and talk like a real live boy. Oh, wouldn't that be a tragedy? Uh, no, don't you worry, me boy. I'll bring a new battery straight back with me. Goodbye now. Goodbye. Was it ever established? Um, Exactly where in Torchy's body his batteries are stored. Now what can I do by myself? That inflicts the most violence and bloodshed on innocent people. I've forgotten what it's like. I'll walk to the village as well and come back with Mr. Bumbledrop and Pompo. Torchy walked along the road. It was much longer to the village than he had thought. 
and soon he began to feel tired. Because he realised he was going the wrong way, and he fell over and died, and the series was ended for good. My voice is getting rather slow. I think my battery is running down and stopping. Oh, I got my wish. His battery ran down completely. I got my wish. He's dead. Torchy is dead. Oh, joy! Oh! Oh, thank goodness! Someone has lost their toy! Mm. It's quite a nice one, too. Oh, judging by your weird fashion sense, yeah, it probably does look like a nice toy. Mr. Bumbledrop was at the bottom of the road when he saw Mrs. Meanie Mouse pick Torchy up. Mrs. Who? Oh, dear. Mrs. Meanie Mouse? The woman is carrying Torchy. His battery must have broken down. Just like we planned. I mean, uh, I'm. Oh, did I drop myself in it then? To you. Come back. I haven't moved. Findings, keepings, and I'm taking this toy home to my boy Bogey. Oh, a train. I'm fed up playing with this train. All it does is go round and round and round and round and round and round and round. What do you expect it to do? Wish I had some more toys. I'll go and look in my cupboard and see if I can find something. Okay, you go do that. You go look in your cupboard and you find a few you have the toys. Oh, I haven't got a thing to play with. I'll make Mummy go to the toy shop and buy me something new. If she knows what's good for her. Okay, here I am. I've got something for you. What is it? It's a corpse. Why? Cool, it's a toy. Did you buy it? No. I stole I it. It's on the road and I thought you'd like it. Cool. You're finding me old rubbish on the road and bringing it home. You really don't care about me at all, do you? Oh, no, he's tapping its crotch. Don't. Stop it. Stop it. I need a new battery. I You're touching his crotch. I'll come with you. Maybe you'll buy me another toy. No, one toy's quite enough. Don't be so greedy. I'll box your ears. If you hit me, I'll let you burn. Don't you talk to me like that or I won't buy you a new battery at all. Uh, I'm sorry, Mummy. I didn't mean it. I'll be very good. Hmm. So, uh... All right, then. You might threats of beatings all round, then. It's good family entertainment. Because the little boy or girl who lost it is out looking for it. Oh, how clever of you to think of that, Bogey. All right, let's leave the toy here. Bogey and Mrs. Meanie Mouth went out. Mrs. Meanie Mouth, OK. lay on the table. How dreadful for him to belong to such a horrid child. Oh, I don't know. Just so. Uh, it's only what he deserves. And in tiptoed, Mr. Bumbledrop and Pom Pom. There's my little Torchy. Breaking and entering is just one of my many talents, Torchy. You didn't know about that one, did you? I've bought a battery, and I'll take out the old one and slip this one inside. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now don't be afraid, Pom Pom. He also bought some petrol that we're going to douse the place with and set fire to it, Torchy. Pom-Pom padded over to the window. And she could see Bogey coming back to the house. Well, that was quick. I'm not going down to the shops after all. I'd much rather play with my new toy in stage. But it doesn't work. You were going to the shops to get a new battery. That's what this was all about. Ding bat. Alright, alright, Pum Pum. Yes, I've just put in the new battery. Okay, let's see where it goes. Thank goodness you came to save me, Mr. Bumbledore. Oh, he's already put it in. Oh, so I don't get to see where it goes. Okay. We'll go at once. We'd better slip out That's a bit of a rip-off. Then we won't bump into Mrs. Meanie Mouth and Bogey. She is very mean, Torchy. She beats me up in the street for money, which is why I have to live off of grass cuttings and tree bark. For running like that. Bogey won't be able to catch me now. Yeah, I should hope not. We uh, should must be more careful in future, Torchy. When you think your battery's running down, you should always put in a new one. 
But I never carry a new one on me. Then you should do. I can't have anything happening to you or Pum Pum. Oh no, think how dull and empty my life would be without you guys. Oh, actually, it already is dull and empty. Still, think about me. I'll buy you another battery and an extra bulb. I want to go back to Topsy Turvy Land now. I'm Why? How? With so many naughty children around. So the, it, the main concern is keeping Torchy stocked up with batteries and uh, bulbs for his lamp. Okay. Who is supplying all the fuel for this rocket going backwards and forwards to Topsy Turvy Land? That's never addressed. I'll kiss you both. Goodbye. Oh, uh, no, Mr. Bumbledrop, please don't. Uh, I, I, uh, I have a forked tongue. You don't want to see my forked tongue. Torchy. Oh, okay. Well, that's uh, that's that over with. That was relatively harmless for a Torchy episode. Um, the usual mix of uh, mild horror, disturbing things, and uh, occasional hopeful moments where I hope that uh, one or more of the characters has died horribly. Sadly, nobody died in this episode. Uh, although I'm sure that Bogey and Mrs. Meanie Mouth... Uh, are currently knocking seven bells out of each other at home. Uh, we don't get to see those scenes, unfortunately. It might liven things up here considerably. Still, three episodes of Torchy Down. When will the next one appear? And will it get even more sick, twisted, and sadistic than it already is? Only time will tell. Goodbye. Okay. More torchy then. I cannot believe there's more. Look, Why is there so much torchy? After that huge list that I read out of productions that have yet to feature on the randomizer, we get we get more torchy. Yeah. What is going on? Thanks, randomizer. Thanks, yeah. Chris. Must have thanks, a screw loose somewhere. Thanks, the planet Piri, where the randomizer was operated this week um, yeah well um, I guess yeah. it's one more down isn't it but it's there's true. so many episodes of Torchy that still could come up it's just it's a worry isn't it it's just so depressing anyway <laughs> at least that's over it's uh, always next week <laughs> well there might be even more Torchy <laughs> oh goodness me anyway thanks Chris thanks for making it through that yeah thanks Chris we know you love Chris Dale and the randomizer and uh, we also and know Torchy. you love Big Rat, Big Rat Bites on, the, uh, on Fab Live so uh, yeah we love all Chris's work and I know he knows that because people tell him all the time on Twitter which is lovely they do yeah. well deserved Chris yeah um, Richard, that's it, isn't it, for this episode, pretty yeah, much? Yeah, I think you're probably for this right. this pod, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I always call it episode, we, we should call it a pod. We should, well, terminology. You know. uh, yeah, a pod, pod is better, isn't it? Pod <clears throat> is more Anderson, isn't it? Yeah, it's, mu- it's much cleverer, isn't it? Much funnier. It is, isn't it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, so, yeah, please, if you haven't already, subscribe, rate, review, and all that sort of stuff, but mm-hmm. actually do it. Don't just listen to us saying those words. Yeah, yeah, Go I mean. On. We, do it now. We, know, we finished. We, we can know. do it now. We can not see do much the more. difference. Yeah. We can see the difference between the number of people who listen and the number of people who subscribed. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, they, they don't match up. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so go and do it. It's just it's very easy. There's just a little subscribe button just there. Yeah, you see it there? That's just it. Up there. Go that's on. it there. Go on. Now, click. There you go. Done it. Good. It's sorted. Wasn't Thank you that very easy? Much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, and now you've done that, you might as well rate and review as well and tell your friends. Yeah. So, yeah, do come back next week. And in the meantime, if you've got any questions and stuff then email it, your question that is, to podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. I should be more specific about yes, these things. Yes, it, it might help. And uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. We might yeah. even read out your email or send you something. And uh, next week or shortly after, we'll be picking a winner yes. for our uh, our reviews um, random winner mm-hmm. selectatron <laughs> yeah. machine. There isn't one. Uh, <clears throat> So if you would want if you want to be in with a chance of winning, drop us a line podcast at jerryanson.co.uk with a screenshot or a copy and paste of your review and the username you used to leave it, uh, and we'll pick a winner at random early December. Yeah, exciting. It could be you. It could be, but only if you rate and review. Indeed. Oh, there's a, that's, that's it, Richard. It could be you. If you rate and review. Rate and review. Amazing. Oh, like it. That there's was not scripted, uh, people at home. <laughs> that, Don't that was, believe it. Yeah, no, they won't. Okay, anyway, should we go away, Richard? I We've think got that's things enough. to do, haven't we? Like, yeah. you know, drink a beer or something. Yeah, why not? Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah. Right. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Stage
stage one complete. Let's go. I thought you were going to go into This Is Your Life for some reason at the end. Was your dad ever on This Is Your Life? Um, I don't think he was, was no. he? Hang on, I'm looking up. Yeah. Uh, this Is Your Life, for people who may not remember, was a sort of a weekly programme on ITV where uh, a well-known celebrity, actor, singer, um, would be surprised, usually at their place of work, um, and whisked away to a uh, um, a studio with uh, Eamon Andrews, it was in my day, and would then be confronted with everyone from their, from their past, families, friends, people they'd much rather not see again, who would uh, regale the audience with stories. This is your life. Yeah. Did he no, he wasn't on This Is Your Life, but he was on Time Of Your Life. Oh. Does that mean anything to you? Time Of Your Life, no? No? Don't remember that? BBC 1983. Uh-huh. Now, unfortunately, I've got an issue where YouTube has logged me out and I can't log in again. It just says, oops. So uh, I can't tell you more about it. Oh, well. But I, I might put a little clip in at the end of this spot. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Anyway, so... <laughs> and that all came from you singing the end uh, theme <laughs> from the podcast. Well, from little acorns, great oaks grow. <laughs> That's a bit generous. Now we're back uh, to you at Pinewood in 1994, aren't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Talking thanks. of little acorns. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Uh, no need to get insulting. <laughs> right. Shall we, um, we, shall we actually go now? Yeah. All right. All right. I'll speak to you soon. Uh, yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Jerry Anderson, that's all a bit violent, isn't it? Just imagine what it would have been like if it was a real thing. Right? Indeed. I mean, indeed. Only puppets. You created Thunderbirds. You created... Uh, beautiful motor cars like this. I know you didn't build it, but it was your idea. Can you talk us round this fabulous Rolls Royce? Yes. Uh, first of all, I think at today's prices, this would probably cost about twenty thousand pounds to build. Believe it or not. Now, you see that Parker would sit in the central position, mm -hmm. and Penelope would sit immediately behind him. And the reason for that is that the wires controlling the puppets would come up out of this centre section where there's no perspex. Yes. Uh, the design was Rolls-Royce approved. Really? Yes. They didn't mind you using a, a Rolls-Royce radio? Oh, no, no, no. We submitted proper designs to them and they approved it. That was a compliment, wasn't it? Uh, it was indeed. And of course, to the puppets themselves and your, what would you describe, chief puppeteer, Christine? Chief puppeteer, yeah, Christine, who's so. been with us over the years. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these most marvellous figures? Well, I made a fiberglass. They, uh, their eyes are operated by strings mm -hmm. and um, each of the joints in the figure are you know, where you would, you would have your own joint yes. so that so you get a natural or as near natural movement as you possibly can with them. And in fact they were quite sophisticated weren't they Jerry? You, you had a, quite an interesting way of managing to make the mouth work. Yes, they used to uh, speak automatically. We would pre-record the voices of the particular puppets and then play them back on the floor. And inside the head, there was an electromagnet, which literally used to make them speak in sync with the dialogue auto automatically. Mm -hmm. Can we have a look inside puppets, eh? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm turning around for the camera. If you're squeamish, could you now look away? <laughs> yes, here we go. And there inside the head, you can see the electromagnet. Hey, hey. What you do with the back of my head? <laughs> you try to pick my brains. His brains are worth a fortune. I nicked him. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice of Parker, David Graham. Good evening. <laughs> One of the most distinctive characters, of course, in, in Thunderbirds. Yeah. Where, where did you get the, the idea from? Well, um, when the series was being planned, Jerry uh, took me to a restaurant for lunch in Cookham, right near the studio, and there was a, an old retainer type waiter there who Jerry told me used to work for the Royal Household, and I think it was the Duke of Windsor. And uh, we got him going, and uh, we said, well, what was he like? He still used it. 
he was a lovely bloke, you know. He was a real gent, you know. I don't make him look like that anymore. Would you like to see the way in this? Well, I looked at Jerry and he said, <laughs> <laughs> that's, the one that came about. that's really how it, that's really how it started. Yeah. So happy we days for you? Very. Yeah, very happy days. Great. Uh, will we ever see these characters again? Well, it's funny you should say that, but uh, we are at the moment uh, in the early stages of pre-production on a new series of Thunderbirds, which uh, I hope will be on the air next year. Uh, no deal has yet been done with a TV company, so it could even be here on BBC. Right. Well, that price has gone up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Yes, it's gone up. I'll yeah. be your agent. Yes, One you. last word. Uh, what do you feel about these enthusiasts behind us? Well, I mean, you know, I, I can only be grateful that uh, they follow me around and support me. I'm, I'm always a little nervous doing this sort of thing, and it's just great for me to have them there, sort of, like cheerleaders. And it doesn't worry you great fans of Star Trek as well? Yes, it does. It does? I should, I should sort that out after the In which case, beam them up, Scotty! <laughs>